1 Thessalonians. And uh, you should, I should have left at each section where people normally sit enough handouts for your family group. If you decide to sit somewhere else, well, look where you normally sit. It's going to be there for you. All right. Now, um, I will say that I had the PowerPoint and everything ready to go, and then I thought of something last minute to be able to do in the service this morning. And so I took the hard drive and added that to that thing and thought, uh, there it was, got a church, and hurrah, I realized this. The PowerPoint is on the hard drive, all right, but the hard drive is still attached to my computer at home. And uh, so there won't be a PowerPoint this morning, but that'll be okay. I uh, will still go through this, I will slowly go through this, that way you can still fill in the blanks. And um, we'll start off. All right? Let me just ask, how many have read through the book of First Thessalonians? Read through it. It's a good book. It's an interesting book. Uh, there's some interesting facts about it that we'll be learning this morning uh, that are very, very different, very unusual. And um, at first, when, when, when you start learning, you may think, well, that's, that's a bit interesting. Uh, but here we go. All right, the author. Now, again, uh, books like this, it's really easy to figure out who, who the human penman is. Look at 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 1. Word 1. And it says, Paul, and Sylvanius, and Timotheus, and the church of Thessalonians, which is in God the Father, and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be to you, and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, now go also to verse, chapter 2, verse 18, and we'll learn another interesting thing about this book, chapter 2, verse 18, it says, Wherefore would it, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. All right, so again, it's identifying that the author of the book is the Apostle Paul. Paul at one time wanted to return to Thessalonica, to return there, um, but he was hindered. Now, here's the interesting thing. All right, as you know how Paul traveled on his missionary journeys and he established churches and saw people saved and uh, put, put pastors there. Um, here's an interesting fact. He had only spent four short weeks with these young believers when he was forced to flee the city due to persecution. All right? So he'd only spent four weeks with this group of believers. And yet, the group of believers were still going on. Isn't that interesting? Like he was there for four weeks. So remember though, Paul's model he would travel with a number of young men that he was training for the ministry, correct? So when they had Bible college or Bible institute or whatever you want to call it today, uh, their Bible institute or their, their training to be pastors was on the move as they traveled. It wasn't where they went somewhere, stayed for three or four years, and then went somewhere else, okay? Uh, they traveled with the one training them. And it would be what we would call and more, we use it a lot, I guess more so in trades than anything else, but it was like an apprenticeship. They would travel with someone who was seasoned and, and had been a pastor and had done these things, and he would teach them as they went and say, why? So when they got to a place like Thessalonica and Paul was only able to be there for four weeks, he had someone he could leave there with the believers to help lead them as he went on. And then as he would leave someone, uh, the Lord would give him someone else to travel with, and he would train them, and, and on and on it went. And so that was the Apostle uh, Paul's model. And so we, we see that now. Um, he had sent Timothy back to help lead them, but now he writes a very personal letter with his own hand. Okay, so after he'd been there for four weeks, they'd gone away a bit, and he sent Timothy back to them to help them out. Right? So I don't know, maybe Timothy wasn't ready to be left when they were there, but 
for whatever reason, he sent Timothy back to help them. You look at 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 17. That can't be right. 2 Thessalonians 3, 17. Well, right, 2 Thessalonians 3, 17, it says, The salutations of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. And so uh, we see that these epistles to the Thessalonian believers, uh, he wrote with his own hands. Um, some of Paul's books, when he was later, just by that fact that Paul wrote it with his own hand, tells us that this came on early in Paul's ministry. Because the later in Paul's ministry it got, he would dictate and someone would pen it for him. Um, because his eyesight, from what we can gather in Scripture and history, his eyesight kind of went the longer he went or had some sort of ailment there. Now, uh, here's another interesting thing. Uh, have you ever noticed in a lot of the Gospels and even the book of Acts and Romans and all the books we've studied up to this point, there were a lot of Old Testament references. Like when you read the books, guess what? There are zero. There, there are no, it says the majority of believers were Gentiles. Thus, no Old Testament references are found in this book. You will not find an Old Testament reference in the entire book of Thessalonians. But one of the first ones we can say that about in the New Testament. Um, so it's a bit different. So we're not dealing with, okay, if you're dealing primarily with Gentiles, why do you think it's not so important to quote the Old Testament? Not familiar with it. They're not familiar with it, correct? They don't know. And now if there's <laughs> Jewish believers, they know the Old Testament, correct? They should know it, at least. All right? Then it says, someone has said that they were a model church. And Paul commends them, uh, condemns them for nothing. You know, usually when Paul wrote a book, he corrected something, and then he taught some things, correct? If you read the book of Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, he doesn't condemn them for anything. Like, he has good things to say about them. So why, in fact, he commends them in chapter 1 and verse 3, and here's three things he says about them. Look at chapter 1 of verse 3. He says, remembering without ceasing your work of faith. So we see they had a faith that worked. They had a faith that worked. They did not work for their faith, but because they had faith, they worked. They served. All right? They had a faith that worked. He goes on and says, and labor of love. They had a love that labored. Kind of goes hand in hand. Love usually requires works to prove the love. Can you imagine if you just said to your spouse that you loved them like once, but you never did anything to show that you loved them, never did anything to show that you cared, never did anything like that? How long do you think that's going to work? Not long. You say, why? Because true biblical love labors. It works. Um, all right. Just because you love and you labor doesn't mean you're going to get it right every time. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? Okay. It doesn't happen all the time. But they had a love that labored. Right? Then he goes on and he says, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. So they had a hope that was patient. A hope that was patient. And now, can I just remember, clarify this, the Bible word hope isn't like our word hope. Have you ever said something, well, you know, I have hope to do this. That means you may do it, you may not do it, but you kind of wish you did, right? The Bible word hope is the same word that we would use assurance. In other words, it's something I know will take place, so therefore I can have hope in it. Understand that, the difference there? And so when it says they had a hope that was patient, because they had assurance of some things, they could be patient. Because they knew who Jesus was, 
they can wait on you. Okay? And uh, that, that's going to come key in a few moments when we see what the book's about. The date. It was written approximately 54 AD from Corinth. And if it was written in 54 AD or right about there, this makes it probably Paul's first epistle. The first one he wrote. Here's another interesting fact. If it was written approximately 54 AD, it means it was written even before the gospel records. It was penned before Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You understand, just because the, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John come first in the New Testament doesn't mean they were written down first. All right? We get that? Just because, yeah, all right? Uh, matter of fact, one of the first books of the Bible probably ever penned, or, or historically, is not, well, it's technically not Genesis. No. It's Job. Okay? Um, Genesis, obviously being written by Moses, was written much after Job, because Job was a contemporary of, does anyone know who Job was a contemporary of? Abraham. Abraham and Job lived at the same time. Sometimes it's really interesting. If you ever get a chance, I'll see if I can find one and show you sometime. Just to get a, all the main Bible characters and you get a uh, timeline of when they all lived. It's amazing to see the overlap in some Bible characters that you would have never thought overlapped because the way they come in the Bible. Does that, does that make sense? And so, anyways, uh, now, this is why the fact that it was probably penned before the Gospels is very critical. Okay? Here's why. We'll go on. Uh, this is significant because Paul begins with an acknowledgement of the Lord Jesus Christ, recognizing his deity. Okay, so long before the Gospels were written, Long before the book of John clearly establishes the deity of Christ, Paul in his writings to the Thessalonian believers already was talking about the deity of Christ. Yes? He called him the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, how many times do we see that? The Lord Jesus Christ, verse 1. And then you go down to verse 3. The Lord Jesus Christ keeps doing it. And here's why this is important. Critics have stated that the deity of Christ was developed later on in the church. That's not so. Okay? They say, oh, well, you know, this whole idea of the deity of Christ, you know, it was taught in the book of Thessalonians. Therefore, you know, it was established later on as the church was established. It's almost like they're saying the church made this doctrine up as they progressed. Yes? Well, they didn't. This book was written before the Gospels. And then the Gospels further establish it. So the deity of Christ is something the church has all, always believed. Always. And if the church doesn't believe in the deity of Christ, they are not a church. They are not biblical. Uh, they should be, you know, remember we said Paul said one of the, the greatest tests of whether something is to be considered biblical or not is what do they teach about Jesus? Do they teach his deity? Okay, we'll listen a little bit. If they deny his deity, sure sign of a cult. Sure sign of a false religion. Plain and simple. All right, theme. The theme. The theme of this book is the coming of Christ. The coming of Christ. Every chapter in the book gives a clear reference to the coming of Christ. Every single chapter book. Look at the uh, first Thessalonians 1 verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from wrath, the wrath to come. Okay? Reference to his coming. Chapter 2 verse 19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing 
are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. Go on, uh, chapter 3, verse 13. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable and holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. All right, so do we kind of get the idea he wants us to be ready for his coming? Well, in case we haven't, let's go to chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I don't know about you, but wouldn't that be nice if before we even said the last amen of this, even this growth group, if that took place? That'd be nice, wouldn't it? See, some people going, uh huh, some people looking at me funny. That would be nice. You say, but, but I got plans. I am sure your plans can wait because his plans are much better. Um, I don't think I would say, but I got plans. No, no, I think I'd rather be with him in heaven, right? That'd be okay. I guarantee you, whatever plans you have, whatever you have cooking back at your house, a better supper of the lamb would be far better. Okay? Uh, you say, but I got a nice house. Yes, but I'm sure it would be nice to walk on the streets, pay with gold, all those types of things, and, and to be with Christ. Anyways. Uh, chapter 5, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see a repeating of at his coming, at his coming, at his coming, at his coming. Isn't it interesting that at the beginning it talked about the, the they had a hope that was patient. <laughs> I don't know about you, but have you ever had someone that was coming over and you were excited to see them? And you just wanted them to come? You know, especially that you, your kids, you know, when they were younger, you know, they would stand outside and they would look and they would look and they would look. And, um, what's even funnier is when you don't tell them someone's coming or you change the fact that they're coming. Uh, one year, when my father-in-law came and visited us in Darwin, we did not tell the kids that he was coming. We did not. Absolutely did not. Matter of fact, we said, oh, we're going to go to the airport, and we're going to pick someone up at the airport. And I just signed him, might have been three or four. Uh, maybe younger than that. I don't know, about that three or four-ish. At the time, he loved the show, Franklin, you know, the turtle. And so, um, he said, well, we're going to the airport. He said, who are we going to pick up? And I said, oh, we're going to pick up Mr. Franklin. He was convinced we were picking up the turtle. And we were standing there waiting. And out walks Grandpa. He looked at him. And we said, we said to the kids, hey, it's Grandpa. And he said, but where's Mr. Franklin? And we said, oh. We forgot to tell you. Grandpa's middle name is Franklin. <laughs> so we played it all. We didn't lie when we told them Mr. Franklin was coming. And they learned something that day that Grandpa's middle name was Franklin. And uh, it was sort of funny because there wasn't all that anticipation you went build up and anything like that. But when you're looking forward to someone, sometimes you have to be patient. All right? All right. Now, uh, 1 Thessalonians, we, we go to, the, there are two phases of Christ's return. Okay, there's two phases of his return. We've got the rapture, and we've got the return. Okay, the rapture and the return. There's a difference. Now, here's an interesting thing. Um, how many times does the word rapture in that form appear in the Bible? Anybody? I see that. That is correct. A big goose egg. It doesn't appear. Did I just say that? I didn't say that. But what does rapture mean? It literally means to be caught away. Correct? Now, if you remember, we did read to be caught up with him in the air. In chapter 3, remember we read that? And so the concept of a rapture, being caught up, is there. Uh, and really, that, that rapture... 
uh, we believe can take place at any time, any place, anywhere, at any moment. Okay? Um, you read scripture, and maybe, maybe sometime when we're done with this, um, we might do a study on, on the millennium and on all those types of things to kind of just look at that um, in an interesting setting. Um, but anyways, so the rapture is what, what we would believe according to scripture is when Christ calls the church out before the tribulation period. In other words, Jesus comes back, but he doesn't set his foot on earth. He just comes back and calls the church out. And then for that, when that happens, that begins a timetable. Um, you, you cannot predict the rapture, but you will know when the return will be. A little bit funny. You know when the return will be. Seven years from the rapture. Full stop. When we're raptured, from that moment, a clock starts, and seven years later, Christ will return. Oh, by the way, we read about that too in 1 Thessalonians. We read about both phases. Because it talks about how he'll return with the saints. Now you know why I always say, do not tell anyone you're going to be in heaven forever. You'll be in heaven at least seven years. That's, that's all you can say. Looking at very funny. Well, if you were if you were raptured today, you'll be in heaven for seven years, yes or not. And then when Christ returned, what did he return with? All the saints riding white horses in white robes. So if you're going to be returning with him back to earth, will you be in heaven forever? No. Oh, and by the way, by the time that millennial kingdom is over, shock horror, you will not be returning to the heaven you do. Because at the end of Revelation, what is there? A new heaven, and a new earth, and a new Jerusalem. You see? So if you hear me say that, it's not being semantic. It's you, you are not going to be in heaven. You, be, you will be with God forever. And I'll tell you what, wherever God is, I'm okay. If it's heaven, I'll be there. If it's back on earth, right, ruling and reigning with Jesus, we'll be there. By the way, that's why the millennial kingdom can be a little bit of a confusing time because you've got interesting things taking place during that thousand year reign on earth. You've got us who will be there, yes, in glorified bodies. Yeah? But you also have finite human beings who will be there, not in glorified bodies, still with sinful natures. Yes? Right? And so it's an interesting time because you get these two different things intersecting for a thousand years on earth. And Jesus will be ruling and reigning when we start in Jerusalem. Uh, and who's going to be ruling and reigning over the 12 tribes of Israel? Well, yes, but according to the Bible, each one of the disciples will be in charge of that. And then um, what about the rest of the earth? Well, that's where, that is where how you serve in this life affects that. Because how you serve here depends how you serve there. Did nothing, you probably get nothing, but you'll be there. That's something, right? And so we'll, we'll go into that when we do a study of that uh, sometime in the future. Now, key words. The key word, if you want to say, is coming. Coming. Talks a lot about Christ's coming. And we believe his coming will be four things. Okay? It will be visible. When Jesus comes, every eye shall see him. It'll be personal. Okay? It's not going to be, it's going to be personal. It'll be imminent. Coming. It will, it, it, it can happen now. It's, it's the first phase of his coming. 
Yes? And it will be powerful. Powerful. Why would the second coming be powerful? Well, the Bible says his foot will touch the Mount of Olives, and the Mount of Olives will literally break in two. Can you imagine? I don't, I don't think there's any more power in that. It'd be powerful. All right. <laughs> Key verse. Chapter 1, verse 19. It can be a combination of chapter 1, verse 19 and chapter 1, verse 3. I'll show you. Chapter 1, verse 3 and chapter 2, verse 19 are the key verses. See why. Chapter 1, verse 3. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope and our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. And look at chapter uh, 2, verse 19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. You know, we believe what these verses to be, these verses, in other words, in, in all of Thessalonians, to be an outgrowth of what? Their faith, their love, their hope. In other words, their faith, their love, their hope outgrew into how they lived. Okay? And then we look at an outline. Right, the outline of this book is kind of interesting. It's what we do a lot in life. Number one, it's looking back. Looking back. Chapter one and chapter three. Uh, the first word after the introduction is remembering. Look at chapter one and verse three. So the introduction of who it is, and, and Paul give thanks to God for them always making mention of you in the, our prayers. And then what does he say? What? Remembering without ceasing. And he goes on. And so um, Paul begins the book by looking back. All right? And in chapter 1, he's looking behind to their faith. He says, you know what? As I look back over the, uh, the one thing, can you imagine the Apostle Paul looking back at the church at Thessalonica? And as he looks back at the church of Thessalonica, he looks back and says, one thing I definitely remember is I remember your faith. I remember the faith you had in God. The faith you had in Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but there's a, I don't know there's much better that, that you can be remembered for than faith. And then in chapter 2 and chapter 3, he's looking behind to Paul's ministry. Talks about things that while well, he was there and uh, things that have gone on in the ministry, and he's looking back on those things. And that's why sometimes it's not a bad thing to look back. Uh, look back over your life and what God's done. Look back over in you know, the ministry of the church and see what God's done. And then number two, chapters four and five, we have a looking ahead. A looking ahead in the future. Look at the transition, chapter 4, verse 1. After going all this looking back and remembering all these things, he says, Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus Christ, that as ye have received of us, how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. You know what he's basically saying? Now that I've reminded you of what you have, live that way more and more into the future. We've looked back and we've talked about your faith, but you know what? 
You know the most annoying thing? Is to be around a church that only looks back and says, oh, I remember when. Hey, if you're only remembering when that you be signed in the now you're dead. If you're not growing and moving forward, you're dead. Okay? Uh, don't, well, it's good to look back, but don't stay in the past. All right? But, but I remember when God used it. Yeah, I've been in churches that have like a 1,500 seat auditorium with 25 people in it. And you say to them, well, what are you doing? Oh, I remember the days when this place was full and we had to add seats and we had to do this and, and we had to, you know, put seats up on the platform and the preacher, when he was preaching, he could only move this way because there's people sitting there and people sitting there. And I remember looking at it and saying, yeah, I remember that day. I was the kid sitting on the front row in the folding chair on the platform that almost got stepped on every time the preacher moved. I remember that. But what does that have anything to do with now? What are you doing now? We're remembering back. And that could be why you have 25 people. Because you remember when we used to do oh, What did you do in this other place? All we were around inviting people to the church to share the gospel, okay? So what are you doing now? Oh, we haven't done that in a long time. And you wonder, right? Uh, so it's good to remember, but, you know, look ahead. And so... He, he transitions with them, and he says, hey, this is good to look back, but now that we've looked back at that, I want you to walk and live it more and more in the present and in the future. And then he tells them in chapter 4, verses 1 to 12, and chapter 5, verses 1 to verse uh, 28, in these two chapters, he tells them how they are to walk. He says, I want you to do this more and more. Now, just so that we can be clear, this is how we walk. This is what we do into the in the present and into the future, and this is how we walk with as in the Christian life, with the future in mind. All right? We're going to talk about that a little bit more in the morning service. And then in chapter four, verses thirteen to verse eighteen, he tells them what they have to look forward to. What they have to look forward to. Look at chapter four, verse thirteen. But I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others have no, which have no hope. Isn't that interesting? When he tells them what they have to look forward to, the very first thing he says is, hey, listen, those that are asleep, you know, that, remember, the, those that are asleep are a Bible word for that they're dead. Okay? They're not, they're, they're not alive. They're, they're dead. He says, you don't have to sorrow for them like those who have no hope. Have you ever been to a non-Christian funeral? It's horrible. It really is. I mean, if you have never been, you should go to one at some point in your life. It's the saddest thing you've ever made in your life. There's just no hope. No comfort. No peace. Nothing. But sadness. But then you go to a Christian funeral. Oh, and there... They was, those are wonderful. I mean, I don't enjoy going to funerals, but I'm saying that they're completely a different ballgame. You say, why? Because we don't, we don't sorrow as those who have no hope. We know that this isn't a goodbye. This is a see you later. Because you know, Christians, we don't say goodbye. That's it. We don't. So we'll see you, see you on the other side. And so he starts off right away by saying, hey, listen, I want you to tell you what you have to look forward to, and that's this. You don't sorrow like other people sorrow. You have a hope. It goes on, and he says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. <laughs> He's saying, hey, just remember this. If you really believe this, then know this. <coughs> When he comes again, they're coming with him. Because they're not asleep. They're very much alive. He goes on, he says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that 
we which are alive and remain unto the coming of our Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. I want to tell you something. It's going to come a time where it's going to be unusual. Can you imagine being alive at that time? Can you imagine, imagine the explanation? Just think about that one for a moment. He's saying, hey, listen, if you're alive at the time that Jesus comes, don't worry. You're not going to cause a problem for those who are asleep. In other words, okay, weird. Have you ever thought through this weirdness of it? Can you imagine being be standing in a cemetery at the moment of the rapture? Think about this one for a moment. Let's, let's just say we're at a cemetery at the moment of the rapture. We're standing at the headstone, you know, the headstones that are in the ground. And generally, if you're sitting at the headstone laying something down, you're standing on the ground that the body is under you. Yeah? You know what Paul's saying there? If that's you, it won't be an issue. You're not going to cause a problem for that loved one that you're standing on top of. You say, why? Because he goes on and says that those which are asleep shall be caught up into the air first, and then we which are alive and remain shall fall. Can you imagine what explanation that, that's going to have to be when all these graves are empty? And then all these living people are gone. I mean, think about that one. Imagine being on the airplane that the pilot and the co-pilot are believers. You better hope that thing has auto landing somehow, somewhere, some fast, right? Imagine being loaded onto a passenger train. Now, maybe this is why they're going to driverless commuter trains. I don't know. Uh, but imagine being on a passenger train and the guy driving the thing or the lady driving the thing is a believer and it's going full tilt you know like one of these speeding bullet things in Japan and it's going full tilt and all of a sudden there's just no driver imagine the weirdness of being in church and let's say there's someone who's a non-believer visiting church that day and all of a sudden everybody's gone and they're sitting there in the middle of the church service by themselves you say, that won't happen. I'll say this, think about this one for a moment. Imagine a preacher preaching to a room full of people and he's the only one left in the room. You say, that won't happen. That can happen. I've known preachers who've gotten saved too. So he tells them, hey, this is what you have to look forward to. This is great. This is exciting. So he gives them sort of an incentive for, for why they're walking the way that they're they're walking, but I mean, just think about the way it's going to be. And I know uh, there's been all sorts of movies made about it and you know, all that kind of stuff, but it's, it's real. It's real. Can you just imagine what it's going to be like? By the way, does it also then make more sense why in the world in which we live, Christians are being portrayed more as a nuisance and a hindrance to our progress? Because if that's the way it keeps going, Hey, the rapture will be a solution. Get rid of all of us troublemakers, you know? Um, and, and, and on they go. But, anyways, all right. Lastly, Christ and the book. Look at chapter uh, 1, verse 10. It says, uh, And to wait for his son from heaven. Whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. So we see in the book of 1 Thessalonians that about Christ is he is the resurrected one. Whom he raised from the dead. He is the resurrected one. In chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. For the Lord himself should descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. You notice what scripture says there? Does scripture say, so shall we ever be in heaven? Or does it say, so shall we ever be with the Lord? 
All right? And so we see he is the returning one. By the way, he can't be the returning one unless he's the resurrected one. You kind of catch that? I mean, I know this is rocket science, right? But if he died on the cross and was buried, he cannot be the returning one if he wasn't first the resurrected one. And that's why the very first thing the book of Thessalonians presents him as, he's the resurrected one. You say, why? Because that gives the validity that he can actually be the... Hey, if you beat death, do you think you can beat things and come back? I mean, more than likely, when someone dies, you don't expect them... Okay, I mean, as hard as it is, and I don't try to be insensitive about this or anything, but if you ever have a loved one die in that first holiday, we kind of get together for a meal, and they're not there. And yet there's still that feeling that at any moment the door's just gonna open, and they're gonna walk in. You know, like everyone has that feeling, and then by the time the day's over and you're cleaning up, the reality hits they didn't walk in. You know what I mean? Yeah? Well, so therefore no one else has been the returning one, right? You say, why? Because they haven't been the resurrected one. But because Jesus is the resurrected one, he can be the returning one. And so that's some things that we learned from the book of 1 Thessalonians. It's an exciting book. Um, next Sunday we'll come back and we'll look at the book of 2 Thessalonians and see what Paul follows that up with. Uh, and then we're, we're winding it down because we're getting into, after the Thessalonians, we get into 1 and 2 Timothy. We get into Titus and Philemon, a lot of small books, Hebrews. And James and one and two Peter, and then we get the three Johns, and then we get Jude. So we get a lot of one chapter books coming up, which may or may not take a whole um, Sunday time to do. So we'll be moving along a little bit quicker um, as we go, and then we get to the doozy at the end, uh, Revelation. So that'll be an interesting book. All right. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for this time that you've given us to once again come together and to. Uh, be able to worship you. And Lord, we thank you that we can learn of your word. We thank you, Lord, that you are the resurrected one and you are the returning one. And Lord, we look forward to the day where we can be with you forever. And uh, Lord, we pray that you help us to walk like that and to live our lives in, in the light of that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.